to St. Bernard's where he is the buildings and grounds supervisor and I know he's a handy carpenter on the side. Um, he uh, early on um, helped us make the wonderful white historic marker plaques for many old homes that you see in town and then when we started discussing the need to rehabilitate our rapidly deteriorating miniature house I thought maybe Tom might be interested in doing this. Um, and he was, fortunately. Uh, he came to the board with a proposal. Uh, we agreed. We accepted it. And the work began, uh, was it the fall of 2011 is when you took it? Yes. Yes. So about a year and a half's worth of work went into this house. And it is remarkable the work that he did. So we are very, very grateful to Tom for everything. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that, uh, like Melissa had said, I started out with just the general look at this miniature octagon house. And in order to do the best job that you can, you need to have information. So I was able to obtain the original prints of the real octagon house. And I looked at the miniature octagon house. And then thanks to Bill and to Ken, I got some more information about the original uh, miniature octagon house. Now, I am not an authority on the real octagon house, but I have a little knowledge of the miniature. And I guess the story goes that the original house was built and there were porches on the house. And then about in the 20s, 1920, that the porches were dilapidated and deteriorated and that they just took them right off. Well, in 36, 1936, keep in mind that the Hoover Dam was just completed and the airship, the Hindenburg, had just blown up, that we were in a depression and that there was an organization formed by the states to have people and the people were artistic people. I don't know if you're aware that they actually had individuals that made books to talk about Wisconsin and other states was part of this project and like in um, the Red Rock Theater was built as a project like this. So we're in 1936 and we're going to start here. Hopefully. Can you guys hear me back there? Okay. Well, this is what was the first look when I came to Watertown. I'm originally a flatlander. It's okay. <laughs> that I came with my kids and saw it, and then after Melissa had asked me to look at it, I looked at it, and I had thought that it might be able to just be repainted and fixed up. <laughs> Now this is the first person that built this house and it was part of the WPA. And this would be Henry Martin. Henry Martin was a carpenter. He built houses. And you see the saw there, most of the work was done by hand. And in 36, there weren't table saws really out. The only ones that owned them were cabinet shops. And I think that it is unique to point out, I don't know if you can see the arrow here, but at this picture, there are no shutters on the sides, and he has little legs on the bottom of his, and this was actually made at Riverside Park. Now, I think in conjunction with Henry working on this house, that there was bridge construction and there were walls being done at the same time as the WPA. This is all what I'm getting here is on the historical site here. Now this is a project here and I just want to talk about these steps here in the front that I have seen numerous pictures. Some of them have steps in the front, some do not. But I believe that this is the closest to the beginning of the project and those would be the correct steps. 
And I think to notice here we have steps going this way and this way. Now the real octagon house does have two steps there. And this is the location at the actual octagon house there. I think this is unique that the individual hands a check for the work with the WPA. And keep in mind, I don't see any shutters on this at this time. And you see that there's four steps here. The last picture had eight. Now this is the painter here. And I think that it's unique if you really look close, both of them are smokers. He's got his in the air, and he's got his in the hand. <laughs> WPA. And I think it is unique to note that in the life of this miniature octagon house, that there was a restoration done in 93 by individuals that were a group of seniors that had done it. And um, when they had done the restoration, they had repainted it and they had replaced some parts and um, it lasted a little bit longer. There is also at the bottom of this, if you were to go on to the link, there's more, but this was an actual postcard that I found on eBay. This one right here. And you see the stones around here and you can see the river right here. And back here would be the power, power dam there. Now there, it has all the shutters on it, except here and here. And I think that this is, we were talking earlier that so many of the kids love to have their picture taken with it. And there's the stairs in the front. Now, at, at this point in time, I think I had gone there and I had seen everything and I wanted to gather information. And the information was that I actually took the Octagon House, took photos of it, looked at it and everything, and I wanted to build it like the original person had built it. So the first step was that I had taken and um, took some of the wood that was the majority of the wood to an individual named Donna Christensen. Donna was the um, head of the wood forest products in Madison and Donna had told me that the wood that was used in the original octagon house was all redwood and she put it underneath the magnifying glass and she said it's not just redwood it is what is called heartwood or the center and that it was old growth now today, you cannot buy old growth redwood anywhere. The only way that you can get it is there are select people that can harvest from the whole rainforest in the Pacific Northwest that have a permit. And if I were to buy the old wood from him, I'd have to mortgage my house. So I actually went and I went to Craigslist and I typed in old growth redwood. There I had to find an individual down in Rockton, Illinois, and I met this individual. I went down there and I bought boards from him. And this, this individual, what he actually did was he restored Civil War houses. That's all he did. And the story goes that this Redwood was actually sold to a junior college in Rockford, and it was in their laboratory, and the laboratory was closing. They took the redwood out, they stockpiled it, and he got in possession of it, and I bought it from him. Now, there's not a lot of redwood out there, and I think the unique thing is, I'm not going to try and teach you about wood or growth or anything, but most of this redwood had 32 rings of growth to an inch. A two by four that you buy today may have two rings in an inch. It's how the, the plants grow and a redwood is a unique tree and it is resistant to bugs and also to water.
So this is what we're going to start here is that this would be the um, first look at it. And as you can see here, there's a lot of chip paint on top of here. And can you see in, the, in these corners here where they're missing and not meeting? A little bit of decay there. And I think that it is unique that these windows, I'm going to call these dollhouse windows. They are proportionate, and, and I didn't mention too that the, the actual miniature octagon house has a scale. Now, what kind of scale does it have? One inch is one foot. So if the total height of the, the unit is 50 feet, well, you know, 50 inches is the height of the miniature. And these dollhouse windows are just sticks that are put in here and glued in here, and they're sort of forced in there. I wasn't real happy with this construction, and later on I will show you how I made the windows. Now there is a front door there, and you can see that the cross pieces are completely missing. And there's a good look at the front door, and pieces missing again. Now this, this is unique to me in that this is the conservatory. I wish I knew every room in the building where the bedrooms and the kitchen were, but the only room that I really know is a conservatory, and that was based on, I read the book that was written by Sai Kwame. Right here you can see where water damage is starting to come in, and the green mold. Now this is, I thought that it would be helpful to myself to have pictures of the real octagon house. And keep in mind that I do not know if this was duplicated the same way that the original was, but I had thought so. And that basically we have a two window, and then we have a one window affair, and then we go two and one all the way around. And I think I had read somewhere that the taxes on houses were paid by the window. Therefore, Mr. Richards had these windows, excuse me, open up and they were called doors. That's the way to do it. Now here's a good picture of the front door here and how many steps are in the original one. When it came to this miniature octagon house on this lower floor here, it's a little bit different than the real McCoy. And I was a little bit, you know, what's going on here? I don't really see according to the drawing, to the blueprint. And I had gone over there one Sunday morning and I go, well, this is nothing like the model. But I actually followed the model as close as I could. That's the back door that when you're at the end, and fortunately if you've gone to the play, you would get a cookie and come out the back door. And here's the observatory again, and here are the back stairs. Now do you see how these pillars played in an important part in the real octagon house? Now with the model, it wasn't necessary to have them. This is the slab that the miniature was on, and I slid it up onto the trailer, and it came apart in pieces. Now I thought that the two should get a closer look at each other, <laughs> so I drove them right up there. That's good. And I was trying to get, you'll see, I, I, I think, I just couldn't get them in view, but here are the actual chimneys here on the mini, and there's the real chimneys, and here is the railings. And I think that you see, both of them are to scale, but you see how close these railings are and how far apart they are here.
Now this is that I had brought it home, and I just want to show you that the top is actually steel. That's a magnet hanging up there. Then I, then I decided, well, in order to keep this the best way I could, I needed to number everything. And I numbered it as I took it apart. I put the parts in a garbage can. If I needed to relook at them, I would have them. And we have eight sides, because it's an octagon house. And I give them each a number. And I think it is unique here, too, that um, inside of each of the rooms, I want to say, there were walls on each side. And there was a floor in there. And I duplicated that. This is the top part. And as you see, this, this has shutters on it. And this is actually leaded onto here. That was popular in the 30s, leading pieces together. And actually what I do here is I put a shim underneath there. I take the torch, heat it up, and the lead comes loose. And then when I am done, there's two screwdrivers and it pops right off. It's right there. That was really a nice shape, inside and out. But I had repaired anything that needed to be repaired. That's some of the dental work. <laughs> this was just to show me that I have to paint that before I re-let it on there. Because if you were to look into the windows, you would see that white. I actually started with, I didn't have my redwood, but I needed redwood, so I am a big recycler. This is a deck that I cut up, and I made the spindles for the top here. I actually have a lathe, and I turned all the spindles myself, made a tool to make them the right size. This is a top, and you can see that most of the chimneys are in good shape. The one back there, I had to replace. And this actually has wording on it. It was a tin roof. It said that it weighed 40 pounds. Now, I don't know 40 pounds for a sheet, how big or what. But that's all the information I got. And these were actually leaded and nailed in place. This is the actual trap door on top, which is the same as the real house. This is a saw setting up to make some cuts. This is a top, and you can see that a piece of molding is missing, so I made my own molding. Now, the majority of the actual unit is all redwood, but when it comes time for molding, redwood is a little bit too, um, too light a wood and a dense easy, so I made it all out of old growth um, pine. And most of the old growth was probably 1870 wood. And it would have 40 growth rings to an inch. This is the bottom after I had gotten it painted inside, I believe. Just cutting some molding there. Do you see the actual spindles would go in and then I would glue everything back together. And those are the redwood spindles there. And I actually tried everywhere either to use plated material or stainless steel. I didn't want to have those rust spots appear. Just cutting a piece on a table saw. These are the posts. And I was just cutting the post on top there. This is the actual place where I purchased the redwood um, <coughs> boards and they were all had nail holes in them, but the nail holes were very small and very far apart. He had 1,000 linear board foot. I bought 150. And I was able, it was really nice, I was able to hand pick my own pieces and select them. And then here I am cutting some molding at home. And I think another unique thing is, thanks to uh, David there at David's Glass, that he had told me that prior to 1900, or the turn of the century, 
glass was discolored or a little bit wavy. After that, from the 1900s to about the 30s, glass was green in color. After the 30s, say the 40s or after the war, that glass became blue or clear. All of the glass in this house was green, and I had bought green glass to restore it. Did you cut the glass yourself then too? Yeah, actually, um, I was so happy with uh, Jerry David, and that I didn't know a whole lot about glass or cutting. And th this project was more a journey than anything else. And I had learned a lot of things. And you know, there's a pair of pliers to, you know, score the glass and then to break the glass. And I cut all the glass and caulked them all. And here we are in the, in the, re the process where we, when you restore something the correct way, you sort of take it apart slowly and you can see down here is the octagon figure. Well, this is a leg. I'm installing a new leg as I'm going. Now, this was unique. I found all sorts of interesting things. I found a miniature pipe. I found a little gun. I found a couple brochures. And I found these cheese grades, I want to call them, all over the place. Well, we removed all the cheese grades. And this actually is a center section, sort of like in the real octagon house, there is a center stairway. And these are only the nuts and bolts that are in there. There is the cheese again. And then once again, you can see that I'm slowly redoing the bottom there. And these are the top windows and the top floors. And you can sort of see the damage that was in there. This was the highlight, paint. When there was someone's name that we're not going to mention was inside of the house when I took it apart. See, I actually made new floors in each one and then painted them and primed them. Something was living in there at one time. <laughs> and then in the inside here, the reason you see the cup and the oil dry was I wanted to get those nuts and bolts off, so I had used penetrating oil. And here I am with, with new boards on the eight and new sides. And these actually have, um, when you come to a house, you have 90 degrees at each corner. An octagon house has 45. In order to get 45, 22 and a half. At one time, I believe I was dreaming in eights. <laughs> this is the top part here and the dental work again. And I, I think it was important to me that I had to keep on marking everything so I didn't get lost where I was. And actually, at the end of this evening, I brought in the miniature octagon house here, more than happy to look at it outside here. And I had it on a lazy Susan, I want to call it. It's a four-wheel cart. I sat on my milk bucket, you want to call it, and I spun her around and worked right in front of me. Now here we are that some of the back work had to be replaced. And then this is new molding had to be replaced up in here. And then the new molding underneath here, and this is the tin roof here. <coughs> this is a door. Now I had showed you the real door and the other door. This door has 36 pieces. This is all routered out by hand, all of these pieces, and there's different pieces. This is the original door, was the only part that I was able to keep from the other one. This part, which you see, is in a little rough shape. All of these parts had to be made. Now, we talk about the windows. I didn't like the stick window. I wanted this to last forever. 
So what I did was I framed these in, in redwood, and then this is old growth here, and I had drawn these out, excuse me. And then I had to mill these all out, and I have a little tiny cutter. So it would make a little tiny radius, and then I would file them. Most of my tools have a cord on it. Some of them you got to use by hand. These are actual windows that I made. And I actually made the windows, 47 windows, but who's counting? <laughs> and that they all have green glass, and that they're actually putty in here. And they're primed, and they're painted before they're ever installed into the house. That's actually installing the back door, and there's glass in that actually too, and in the front door there's glass. And I would take a panel, and that would be the panel, and keep in mind that we have four floors there, and we would do whatever needed to be done at that panel. This panel just has this small window, but you see that the sides are all redone and painted and finished. These are the actual decks that go on the outside. What I actually did was I took and I covered each one of these with redwood all fitted as close as I could. And then I would take them out and put windows in there and you see that it's all painted on the inside. Now here's a conservatory right here. The only reason I mention this, a lot of work. You really don't see the work. All of this molding has got six different curves to it and I made it all and you can barely see it. But there the windows are in place and keep in mind you have to paint some things before you install them. Now this is the other door on the, that floor there. Three doors, but if you count how many windows open up, there's a lot of doors. Now this is pretty close to, well it is finished inside up there. Now all of this does have glass behind it. This was my incentive. Inside of my shop, I had taken the old pieces and put them together. If ever I wanted to look at something, how it was done, the two windows a distance apart, I'd just go over and measure it, and I could see how the weather was outside too. <laughs> <laughs> this is looking at it from the neighbor looking at it. I hope he didn't mind too much for a year. This is the top. And what I had done was, after I had repaired all of this, painted it all, I leaded it back on, and then I refixed these, and this is actual Bondo, same thing you would use in a car. And then I had filled all these in because there was a lot of damage to the seams. And then there we are with all the decks on. And then I had used a marine paint on top of here. Battleship Gray. These are the spindles for the railings that went around there. Not counting, but 285. <laughs> Each one of them was made from a solid piece of wood. These are the actual shutters that went on the side. I painted everything inside and out before I installed it. And there I am actually putting the square on there, and all of the screws, whoa, whoa, <laughs> okay, this is actually, I made some of the shutters because some of them were in bad shape, and you actually have to cut each one, and I think just to, for myself, Here's my cutter here, here's the hole down, here's a piece of tape, and here's a measure. And they were one quarter of an inch apart, so I would saw one, 
Move it a quarter, clamp it. Move it a quarter, get a cup of coffee. <laughs> and this is pretty close to, you know, being all done. And this is a cart that rolls around. And those are my stops so it doesn't move. <coughs> and I don't like to paint with a brush, so I spray paint anything I can. And I actually would put the railings up here and then spray each sides of them. This is a front door with the steps on it. <laughs> and that's, I think that's the completion, but I, what I actually did was I took pictures of each of the eight sides. I think the unique thing of it is, is here, um, there were little boards placed on top of here, the original one, and I had replaced those old back in there, and I actually took each one of these boards and drilled a little hole in there so the post would sit in there. So, um, if you have any questions or anything, I would be more than happy to answer them. And um, if you so desire to go out and look at the house, more than happy to. From here, it will go back onto the trailer. And I don't know if we're going to get concrete poured before the ribbon cutting. But if we don't, the house will be on the original um, slab out there for the ribbon cutting and um, I want to thank Melissa for getting me involved and it really was a nice project met a lot of people and had a good time. By the way, I did apologize to you several times over the past year and a half about that. Right. 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 Bob, could you say what your thoughts were of Henry Martin and his woodworking design abilities and technologies? as you were restoring it? Well, I, I think that um, Henry was a master craftsman. Now, I'm going to say there's birdhouse builders, there's rough carpenters, and there's finished carpenters. I believe Henry Martin had the ability to make the house, make the cupboards, do the flooring, do the roofing, do everything. And obviously, if he knew how to lead, which is a dying art today, he was a skilled craftsman. And I think, um, I think it was unique in this time of the Depression that we just didn't want everybody to work. I think we got skilled people to work. And I think that he did a skilled job. Was he from Watertown? Do you know what he did? Yes, yes, absolutely. In that he has houses to his credit that he was a carpenter. He was a house builder. He lived here in Watertown. The last that I knew, he had relatives over in Deerfield, and he moved over that way. That's the last, because I actually looked up his name and saw in the old records that he had lived here in town, and he, that he was a carpenter was his trade. There is some question, though, because there is also the name of Paul Moore that comes up mm -hmm. in a connection with the building, too. And there have been descendants of the Moors from around this area that occasionally come up to the Octagon House and talk about how their ancestor built the home. But when I found the pictures on file at the historical site in town here, it mentioned a William Crepo and Mr. Martin, and he's obviously identified in the picture itself. And then Paul Moore, I think, is also mentioned on one of them. So we're not sure, unless we can find the actual WPA uh, blueprints and file. And we do have the number on that one uh, postcard. It's project number, I think it was 875. And if there, was, if there is, I don't know where those records are held at the National Archives, but if we can ever find that, we can maybe identify something more, even if we have the plans showing how it was originally put together as well. Yes. I have two questions. Sure. How many hours? <laughs> well, 
in my shop, I have a radio, I don't have a bed, and I had to leave to go to the restroom, but I would say over a thousand hours. And if you really want to get technical, I believe that I might have gotten a dollar seventy-five an hour. <laughs> because, you know, the, the price of just the lumber alone was over a thousand dollars. You know, but I, thanks to my wife, I have time. <laughs> you know? So, that did you know how much the little house cost to make? Excluding your time. Excluding, well, the actual, what it, what it transpired was uh, 5,000, 500, was it? I believe so. Right. And probably what I spent, I would say probably about 2,500 was just in wood paint material. So, you know, I, I tried to use stainless steel, galvanized, you know, good products that would last. Yeah. You know. And I would like to call everybody's attention to the fact that the money for this came from donations, kind and generous donations from you, our members. And so everything was paid for by donations. And we're very grateful for that. Any other questions? Mr. Raisler? I am. Well, actually, two observations for Tom. Um, in the early photographs, you showed the carpenter and some of that work out at Riverside Park. Down along the riverbank, along the walkway, uh, actually it's opposite mm -hmm. Chamberland, off in that corner, there's some city buildings. Mm -hmm. There are remnants of two dove coats or pigeon houses. Mm -hmm. and the tops of them used to have ornate homes on them. Mm -hmm. That, I don't know, have you seen pictures of that? No, but you know I'll that... Get, I have some, I'll get a copy to you. I have a hunch that those men made the tops of those bird houses oh, also. Gee. The houses are gone now, but they were very ornate and they were styled to match homes of that time period. I'll be dirty. And the other observation, a couple of times you talked about all the effort you put into making that sunroom or solarium. Yeah, the, the observatory they yeah. called it in the book. Right. In the family journals at the Octagon House and, and old notes, that is one of the most popular corners to the Richards family. They, mm. they were often in that part of the house, had many photographs taken. People commented when they came to visit, that's where they found Eliza and Anna very often. And it was a warm area, sunny and warm, and they very able to could read. But um, it's interesting that you would find yourself putting all that attention into that little corner of the house. And that's where they spent a lot of their, their daytime hours. Mm. What yeah. side of the building is that? To the south? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. To the south. Yeah. Yeah. The green side. The south side, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you get the south. Out of one of the sets of windows in that in those angled walls, you look to the west. And that street was named Sunset. Oh, and I remember that. Yeah, and that's where, the, when they looked out in the afternoon, they would okay. see the sunset out that window. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah. In terms of uh, percentage, how much of the wood would you say or estimate you were able to save? Well, I, I would say from what the original unit was, in that the very top and the steel roof, I'm going to say probably 90% is all original. The internal structure, most of it's original. All of the outside is brand new. All of the decks are brand new. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the shutters I was able to save, but all the windows are new. So I, I think that it was a good job of restoring what was able to be restored. You know, I just didn't cut something off because I wanted to. But um, there were more details than what I was able to show. and I. I'm sorry, guys, but I cut about 200 pictures out. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Oh, <laughs> one, other, one other thing I want to mention is, if you look at the photographs of the little house, you will note that the roof line, it's a small thing, the roof line goes upward. Instead of on the actual octagon house, 
where it dips inward to collect the rainwater. Right. So that was one change that the original builders made to the little model. Right, right. I, I'm sure that a lot of you have this book. Yes. And in this book here, there are pictures of the miniature octagon house. And you will see, just like he had said, differences between the real McCoy and this. And, and actually, you can see that the snow is in the roof here, and they were able to collect that water. Did you have a question? Yeah, apparently more for you. We're not going to let children climb on it again, are we? No. <laughs> yeah, there was I mean, a way I think that you could hermetically terrible. seal it in a bubble and let, let it just hover instead of being anchored <laughs> to the ground. I think we would love to have it done. But right now, the only thing that we can say for certain is we are going to be putting cement around it, redo, trying to redo the pedestal because the pedestal itself tends to dip a little bit in the middle and that makes water collect and wick up through the whole thing. And then some sort of a chain, a barrier around it of sufficient width to keep everybody from actually getting too close to it. Barbed wire? Or an electric wire. Because I'm a kind person, I suggested that we plant barberry, but they didn't vote for that. <laughs> I, I just want to put a plug in for Jerry Borkert, who's kind of proud of his doll houses. How is this miniature kind of like that hobby? Do you know? He lives, a, he's an ex teacher in Watertown, and he gets pretty detailed on the interior of his doll houses. Well, th this, um, first of all, the larger the scale, the. Um, the modelness is different. When you are making dollhouses houses and you put carpeting in them and you put electricity and you make furniture, <laughs> that's a dollhouse house <laughs> that you look at and you don't play with. That you can open up almost, you know? That, this is more that it is a replica there. And, and the big thing of it is, is I'm sure you've gone to museums where you have seen the battleships, you know, in the big glass case. And you can't have all of the detail in something one twelfth scale, you know. Can you put like the Richards figurines inside there somewhere? <laughs> you know, you could, but but I think the best thing of it is you can take a flashlight and go into any window, and you can see the center staircase, and you can see each room. And I think it is unique that um, how that Martin had all of the windows. You know, you can see right through them on the top and that everything is facing the right direction as the real one. So. Any other questions at this time? You said you have it just out in the hallway? Yeah, I brought it here. It goes with me everywhere. <laughs> and I thought that it would be nice for you guys to see. Oh, We've talked you. about it. Wow. Now, you know, just as you leave, just take a look. And if you do have any more questions, I'd be more than happy to. And I thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Fascinating. I wouldn't have a chance to do a long and soft expensive Oh my gosh! Look at that!
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but that would be one whole piece of glass. Yeah, it's yeah. oh, no, cool. Yeah, it's cool. But I think it's unique, you know, you stand here and you look right through that window. Yeah. Now you can see the other window. Right yeah. Oh, it is something else. Oh, thank you. Okay, I sure will.